be seated. Thank you. As you can hear in my voice, I'm quite up to par on my voice and my 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 breath, but that's okay. Um, I'm I'm thinking God is showing me sometimes. You know, I as uh, Pastor Lee alluded to a lot of the things that I'm doing, and God shows us sometimes in His own way that okay, time to step aside and let other people work too. Amen. So I'm, I'm learning lots of messages today. It's a blessing just to hear everyone speak on fathers. And, and again, happy Father's Day. Amen. So from the, the things you've heard today what, and the descriptions of father, what, what would you think would be a good title of a message today? Yeah, you know where I'm going. <laughs> things that have stood out, anything, just shout them out. What, what are the, some of the, the words that have been used to describe a father? Reliable. Great father, reliable, reliable. provider. Good, leader, dependable, example, there it is. And that's the title of my message this morning, Sound Doctrine. What example are you setting? And I, I took some notes and I, I, could, I could almost just preach off of that. But an example, we're, we're talking about Sound Doctrine. Pastor Lee alluded, you know, I'm, I'm kind of piggybacking on, a, on a, where Pastor Lee was going with the Wednesday night Bible study on the example it was said. He talked about Job and all the things that he did, he sinned not. Amen. Doctrine. What is doctrine? What does the word doctrine mean? We get to the point where we say sound doctrine and we're thinking, okay, got to break out my Bible and my concordance and, and get down into the neat, d- deep nitty gritty and blow the dust off of this book and read this definition and go over here to this commentary and, and get all into theology. And No, the word doctrine just means what's taught. That which is taught, doctrine, teaching, concerning something, the act of teaching, instructing. That, that's what the word doctrine means. Yes, we have our doctrine. We have things we teach. And yes, the Bible is very important and we should know it. But that doesn't mean all of us are going to be Bible scholars or go into Bible school and have our nose in the thing all the time. I mean, there's some of us that are called. That's what we're called to do. Some are called to know this very well to teach it. But we need to know it enough for salvation. We need to know enough to know what we're talking about and share things. But doctrine, what are you teaching? What am I teaching? And I'm not talking about from this pulpit. I'm not talking about from the the lectern over there behind the camera for Children's Church. I'm not talking about a Bible study. I'm talking about day-to-day living. What are you teaching? What's your example? And as we talk about fathers, this is a message that I could aim right at fathers because it's important, but it's really for all of us. But I want to highlight it. Fathers, what are we teaching our kids? What are we teaching our wife? Now, we've heard a lot about what a man's role is. And I won't take away from a woman's role either. They both have a role to play in the home. Amen. And the man may be the head of the household. That doesn't mean everything is going to be comfortable and rosy. Sometimes when we speak something that's not popular with the rest of the family, when we know that God has pointed a direction and said, this is what we got to do. Amen. It's not always popular sometimes. But on the other time, I think uh, I heard the word humble for a father as well. It doesn't mean we're always right. Sometimes we, it does us well to listen to our wife, and sometimes even t- does well to listen to our kids. It does us well to stop for a minute. You know, we come in the room and got to lay down the law. And we don't even know what's, maybe what's going on in our kid's life that day. What am I teaching? I'm teaching that what I've got to say is more important than anything going on in their life. That's what I'm saying right there. And I've learned the hard way with, with, with our daughter. Sometimes there was a time just to listen, to hear what's going to come out of her mouth, to hear her heart. And then I could take a step back and then be the father and address the situation as it needed to be addressed. So that's the fathers. Of course, that could be to mothers. That could be to the children. That could be to, to anyone. But I want to highlight this for fathers today. Take time to listen. Listen to God and listen to your family. So what do we teach? You know, we have influence. You have influence, every last one of you. You have the ability to teach, to share, 
and to influence the pe- people around you. And if you don't, you should be. Amen. But you can, and, and reality is you are. Because we affect the people that we're around every day. And this goes back to sound doctrine. Is what I'm teaching sound? Is what I'm saying sound? Is it correct? Is it wholesome? Does, does it add to people's lives? Do I let the word of God speak through my life? Do I let it speak through my, through my friends, family, coworkers, acquaintances, even strangers? When you're standing in the grocery line, yeah, I'm kind of diving right into it. You, when you're standing around complete strangers and people start to complain, do we join in with them? When our coworkers want to complain about the boss, do we, do we, do we just dogpile on top of it? Sometimes there's a time to maybe just be silent, maybe not be a part of the conversation. There's a time to speak up because God will give you the words. That sound doctrine comes from the written word, the Bible, and that sound doctrine that we teach comes from the Holy Ghost Amen. to live after the Spirit of God. And you'll be amazed. And I, I, and I, I know who I'm talking to, and, and I know that, there's many of you, if not all of you, have had that experience where God says, say this or don't say that. And that seems foreign. When you tell people in the world that, they're like, you're crazy. You're hearing voices in your head. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's, it's an audible voice. Sometimes it's just speaking to my heart. And I would think I was crazy too, except for I've proved it. Yes, sir. Proved it because I've done it. I've stepped out on faith. And said the words, that, okay, God, this ain't going to go over so well, but I'm going to say it. And you know what? God worked this situation out in a way that I never could have seen it happening. See, the, the wonderful thing about living life is there, there's no, the script hasn't been written on the words that we say. We watch TV or movies or read a book or somebody tell a story, and this person says this, and this person says that, and this person reacts this way, and I'm sitting here reading this saying, no, no, no. If that person said that to me, I'm going to knock them out. But this thing all happened all nice and peacefully and rosy. Because they got to write the script. They wrote the script for that movie, for that book, for that TV show, for that play, whatever it was. They wrote the script for a purpose. That's the dirty trick of Hollywood. They, they, they want you to feel a certain way. But that, that's a sidebar there. And we try to, to watch people in life and we, we look at the, the world and what it portrays and we could try to emulate that and try to make it work. And then we have this society that's not of God. Or we could say, when someone says something and I want to react a certain way, you, you ever played out a scenario in your head, you're mad about a situation and, 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 and you, you're walking, you're going home or somewhere and you know that this is going to happen. You know this is waiting for you. And I'm going to say this and he's going to say that and I'm going to say that. And here's how the whole thing's going to play out to the end. Well, that's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Prophecy. You've made it happen the way you scripted it in your head. I'm going back, talking about sound doctrine. Letting God guide you in that situation before you walk in the door. Walk, praying, praying, God, I, I know this situation is about to blow up, and this is how I see it, but I know you can make it go a different way. And that's sound doctrine. Because now you get to teach somebody. Now you get to be an example to somebody, not because, I, I, not because you're anybody great, because God just used you. Because you let God speak to your life. Sound doctrine. If you believe in Jesus, you have a hope and you have something to share. I'll say it again. If you believe in Jesus, you have a hope. And that's sound doctrine, knowing that we have a hope in Jesus Christ and you have something to share. Even when you think you don't have anything to share, you have something to share. Our theme scripture for the month, a month I failed to read it, it's 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Everything that God gives us is for that. If he speaks it to your heart, if he, if he shows you something in the scripture, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, Instruction in righteousness. We correct someone in meekness, as the scripture says. Instruction in righteousness. Not just instruction for instruction's sake, but instruction in righteousness. Amen. First Timothy 4.12, Paul is speaking, to, writing a letter to Timothy, who's a young leader at this point. He's, he's mentoring him as, a, as, a, as an elder. 
And he says, let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. There's a lot of words there. Sometimes we hit that scripture and we just let no man despise thy youth. We like to, to grab onto that one if we're young. So uh, many of us, no matter what age we are, have a, have a tendency to, to feel like I'm, I'm down here. Let God have his way. But be an example of the believer. Sometimes we stop there. But how do we be an example? In word. In my word, the word that I speak. Word is how I'm presented to, to, to people. And, and I have to make God's ways my ways. Or my word is just me. But in word, in conversation, how we talk to each other. Be an example in your conversation. Be an example in charity. Charity is love. And I believe that the word charity in the scriptures as we see it is bigger than any word L-O-V-E that we can put in the English language. The word love that we, we use in English, lang English language doesn't even convey what this word is talking about. A love fest, I believe it calls it. it it's huge. I mean, it, it's having a care for someone else more than you have for you. In spirit. You know, this life is more spiritual than most people want to believe. And in faith, sometimes you got to trust in God. No, not sometimes, all the time. And in purity. Are my motives pure? Are my ideas pure? My thought pure? Thoughts pure? Have I come into the scenario, whether it's with my family or with the world, in a way that's pure unto God? In a way that, and that, that's hard to do sometimes. I know it's easy to stand up here and read it out of the scriptures, but that's not an easy thing to do. Because we're humans. We're, we're flesh and blood. We have all kinds of things that we like to do. We have a favorite food we want to eat, favorite car we want to drive, or motorcycle we want to ride. We want a favorite place we want to go. Maybe we just want to go to sleep. Maybe we want to watch our favorite TV program. Maybe, we, maybe we're, we're, you know, the, the team at work's got an idea, and, and you just know that's the way you want it to go. Impurity. Yeah, even at work when it's something totally unrelated to God, impurity. God can work things out. First Peter three fifteen through seventeen. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. I want to stop there. How many times do we apply that scripture to the family family scenario? Or do we think of that more of just people in general? It's valid in both places, but I want to highlight the Father again. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks. Sometimes that man could be your, your son or your daughter or your wife. Give, a, hope, give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. And I'm going to go back to the very first few words. The first thing we have to do before you even get to giving, is giving an answer. Sanctify Amen. the Lord God in your heart. I don't have an answer if I haven't, if I haven't made God first made God first in my life, if I haven't purified myself, if I haven't kicked out the world and said, God, you sit on the throne of my life, I don't have an answer for anybody. I may have some words that sound good. I could get up here in the pulpit and read some scriptures, but I, I don't have anything if I don't put God first in my life. And you'll be amazed. You get up in the morning, you set your feet on the ground, and you set your heart to God first thing. And in every scenario, in every situation, God will show you things that you, you, you can't even put an understanding to. Because God is just that big. Now I need to re read the rest of these verses because life isn't always perfect. So having a good conscience, verse 16, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers. And just because they're speaking evil, evil of you, just because the things aren't going the way you want them to, doesn't mean you can't have a peace of God in your life. And when they speak of you as an evildoer, that they may be ashamed 
that falsely accuse your good conversation to Christ. For it is better if, if the will of God be so that you suffer for doing well than for doing evil. Sometimes it's easier to do evil than it is to, and just go with the flow than it is to do what's righteous. And sometimes we, you know, it's like if, if I've got a hammer in my hand and I'm pounding nails, I, I know I want to pay attention that I don't smack my fingers because I know there's pain coming if I hit my hand. And sometimes going into a situation, it feels like I'm about to smack my hand with a hammer because I can see where this thing's going. But it says, better is the will of God be so that you suffer for doing well than for doing evil. Sometimes we suffer for doing the right thing. And that is better. It's better in the moment because that goes back to being an example. Because if somebody is treating me wrong for standing up for what's right and there's a group of people, the rest of the people see what's going on. There are other people that will see, hey, he's standing up for righteousness regardless of what is going to happen. He's, I'm going to say it again. We, when we stand up for righteousness, people see it. That's part of being an example. That's part of your doctrine, your teaching. That's what you're teaching people every day. If you give in to them, if I give in, and just go with the flow instead of standing up for what I know is right in a situation that's just totally wrong, well, I've just taught everyone else to do the same thing. I have taught someone the wrong thing. John 13, 14 through 16. We have an example. When we talk about us being an example, we, we have an example here as well. Jesus himself even points out in John 13, if then your Lord and Master... If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. For verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than that sent him. Jesus was being a servant of all. And that's the example we have set for us to be a servant. I mean, even, even in our church structure and our leadership, we could stand up here, the, the, the four of us that are, are pastors, and, and say, oh, you're serving us. No, it is not the case. Amen. Amen. We are here to serve you. We don't lift ourselves up on a pedestal. And if you come to serve Christ in any capacity, you're, it, it's, it's a servant role because that's where the reward is. I want to talk a little bit about Apostle Paul. He went through a lot. And his example towards us is what I want to highlight. So we, we, when we come into Scripture and we read of the Apostle Paul, he's, he's one that's persecuting the church. He's one that's fighting against the Christians, causing them to, even, to be put to death or even put in prison. He's doing some bad things. He's harassing Christians. And then he finds himself blind for three days. He's struck down. And he hears the voice of God. And God said, tells him in no uncertain terms, you're on the wrong side of this. Amen. And he hears the voice of God. He repents. And he's healed. So now he's in a bigger predicament. Now, on one side, he's turning, since he's turned to Christ, he's turned against this, this doctrine, this teaching, this, this Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's turning against it now. And now he's putting himself in a position because the high priest, they're not happy with this. He was doing the bidding of the priest. He's doing, the, you know, he's the one setting, at this point, was setting the example for all the scribes and the Pharisees and giving them their validation that these Christians are wrong. And now he's on the other side of the fence. And he's making a decision. A decision that could very well cost him his life. He's in a position now, they, they want to deliver him up to the courts. They want to put him to death. They wanted to just bypass the courts, actually. They, they, they wanted to call him up to a certain way and ambush him along the way. They wanted to put him to death. So he knows full well his decision could likely end in his death, and he doesn't care because now he realizes what he needs to be teaching is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. He refers over and over to his doctrine. That doctrine is the doctrine of, of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Because that's what they hated at that time. Amen. And now he's also putting himself in a predicament. 
Picture someone who's harassing Christians on a daily basis stepping up in this pulpit to teach. Better yet, if I'm the person that was in that scenario harassing Christians, I very well could have caused one of your loved ones to be dead and I'm preaching the gospel to you. I very well could be the reason that one of your loved ones are in prison. That's what Paul was facing to come preach to the Jews. Yet he did it anyway. He knew the doctrine. He knew what he had to teach was that important. It didn't matter. He was stoned, put in prison, and the earth quaked, and the chains fell off his wrists and off his feet. And what does he do? His heart is for the jailer because he knows that the, the life expectancy of a jailer when someone escapes isn't very long. So what does he do? First thing, he cries out, do thyself no harm. I don't know, my, my, my inclination to be at the door. No. He goes to the jailer and says, do yourself no harm. And then he, then he witnesses to them and ministers to him and his entire family to see them saved. And the jailer asks, what do I have to do to be saved? And they were baptized that day. His heart, his doctrine was to teach Christ, not to run away from it. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked, bitten by a deadly snake. And yet, we have all these letters to the churches. And these aren't just random letters, just "Mm, let me just preach some messages, write some some good things. No, these were letters about specific people to specific churches and specific congregations. He had a vested interest in all these churches. And most of, his, most of his ministry was done from prison. How's that for being faithful? Most of his ministry was done from prison. The things that he did, the raising up, the mentoring. You know, we, we like to have mentors hand on, hands on. We like to have people right here teaching us and guiding us and leading us. How would you like to be mentored by somebody in prison? His doctrine had to be pretty strong to have, to, to, to have for some people to believe a man who's in prison to be able to be mentored by a man who was in prison, to to have a church established and built up by a man who's in prison. Through all of that, he's dedicated to one thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which... I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He was dedicated to the body of Christ. He was dedicated to the gospel, and he, and he, he had a dedication to see the body of Christ raised up, edified, taught. So that's what Paul taught. That was his doctrine. It, it's he, in doctrine. If you, if you haven't figured it out, doctrine is what, doctrine is as much speech as much how we live as our speech, yeah. because we teach as much. Actually, we probably teach more by how we live than how we speak, because we spend a lot of hours of the day talking. Amen. But people spend more time watching what we're doing than we spend te- teaching them something. Because there's people that will hear and see the things that you. Hear the th- things you say, see the things you do that you don't even know that they're watching you. And you're teaching them. You're affecting their lives and you don't know it. So that's kind of a, kind of a good thing to, to keep in mind, you know, when you, when you speak things, when you do things, when you go places, the things you think nobody else sees. And I'll take it a step further. Even the things that you know nobody else sees. Because the things that I do, I could say, oh, this only affects me. It doesn't bother anybody else, but it affects me. If it affects me, it's going to affect how I act around somebody else. So, yeah, it does affect somebody else. But God wants us to be righteous even in our most private times as well as when, when we're in the spotlight. You know, sometimes it's easier in the spotlight because you know everybody's watching. But in, but in the time when you, you don't think anybody's watching, when you let a word slip and all of a sudden you turn around, oh, I didn't know you were there. When you find yourself doing something, you shouldn't be. Paul taught a lot of things. But first and foremost was the gospel. That's, that's the one thing he wanted to be clear, that no one come in and preach another doctrine, that Jesus is the answer, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is, is God Almighty, and that there's a spirit to be walked after. There's a, there's a spirit to, be, to listen to, 
and to allow it to control your life. And sometimes we think of that as a bad thing, a spirit to control your life. You know, we think of movies and exorcists and people's heads spinning around. No. We, we make a choice every day on what spirit to, to give into. Even a blood-washed Christian, full of the Holy Ghost, if I'm wandering and I'm entertaining something, a lust, a desire, a want, I'm entertaining another spirit. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting things, but when it becomes a lust, when it becomes something that's, that's forbidden, something that God has, has said, no, no, that's not for you. Amen. Now you're entertaining another spirit. When you're in the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Jesus said, and no, it's not wrong, wrong scripture. Uh, Paul again, first, all right, first John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Again, what does my life say about the God that I serve? What does my life, you know, do I, do I show off the things that I've got or do I show off what God has done for me? I, I've taken the occasion quite a few times when either people from the congregation or even some people from out of town to walk around the property here. And, and, it, and it's awesome. We've got this building and six acres of land and we've got lakefront property. And it's easy just to say, look what we've got. And I have to be careful because it's not about what we have. It's what God has allowed us to have. It's what God has given us. And the bigger picture is what can God do here? What does God want to do here? And I'm, I'm amazed at, at people and their generosity with things because sometimes I can be selfish. You know, I mean, when, when, when Jim Bailey, he's taking some time to, and it made me sad that I saw that you sold that bike, Jim. But he's, he's taking time to put, ta- put together this 1972 Harley Davidson. You know, he's put his blood, sweat, and tears in his bike. And I come over to the house and he said, here, go take it for a ride. That, that's kind of an, a, a selfless thing, you know. Most people are pretty, pretty uh, tight with letting other people ride their bikes. <laughs> Pastor Payne would do the same thing, even Pastor Thomas, those that had motorcycles. Adam Payne gave me his bike. So here, ride it from Virginia back to Illinois. People that have homes, cars, that let people use them. Because they know that what... what, what what we have is of God. People that let other people spend time in their homes. Because really naturally, in the natural flesh, oh, this is my house. I don't want nobody in my house. They might make a mess. I might break something. But I, I still see the hospitality that's, that's put forth by, by people here that, that bring people into their homes because it's not their home. They, they let whatever they have be used of God. You know, I've got a laptop computer. Oh, you need it here. Take it. Need to borrow my car. Need to borrow whatever it is, a tool. You know, I saw a text come over on, you know, we needed, somebody needed a, a table saw for something and someone pipes up, hey, come and get it. I've got one. Amen. Guys can be pretty particular about their tools because there's a good chance we may not get it back. Of course, that's always an excuse to buy another one, but anyway. No, the thing, love not the world. That goes to the things that we have, our possessions. And there's nothing wrong with them, but love not the world. Let the love, and that, and that again, speaks to what we teach people. If, if, I, if I hold back on something, I teach someone that, no, oh, it's mine. You can't have it. it, it, it it's what we teach. Yes, we show a respecter of persons. I'm teaching something. So our doctrine, what are we saying? What are we teaching? What are, what are you professing? Another good question. Do you know what you're talking about when you do, when you do speak? Because if, if I try to teach a doctrine, if I try to teach something and I don't even know what I'm sharing about, it, it is prudent to know what we're talking about, to be studied. It's one thing to have a scripture and share it. It's a whole other thing to, to teach a doctrine, to teach a teaching of the scripture and, and not know what we're talking about. Because I've been guilty of it. I, I, and I've been corrected over the years with teachers saying, uh, did you actually go and read that? You know, we, we take the, uh, the, the sermon quotes, we take the preacher's quotes and take the one-liners out of, out of scripture and, and, and they sound good until you read the whole chapter and the verses on top of it and below it and you realize there's a bigger picture and you realize God is, God is showing, you know, showing something bigger in, the, in that whole passage. Know what you're talking about. Amen. 
what doctrine is delivered unto you? Romans 6, 17 says, But God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the doctrine that was delivered to you. What doctrine are we listening to? Again, who, who are we listening to? Is the doctrine of men or the doctrine, doctrine of God? And then, and then resting in that and, and, and cherishing that doctrine. Walk in the Spirit. I, I, and, and I can't emphasize this enough. Walking in the Spirit, listening to God. Again, I know I said it, but I want to say it again. God will guide you in the things that, that you, 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 you see, you think you know, the things you hear. There, there's a truth to be had in, in just listening to his word. And in the, as you look through the scripture, I mean, there's a lot of things that we could say we should teach. But I want to highlight one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And we talk about the first and great commandment. Jesus said the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. I mean, the first and greatest commandment is to love God with everything you've got. And this Jesus said... The second is like unto it. I mean, right here, right with it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. And that's really the doctrine I want to see, want to speak in my life, that I love God with everything I've got, and that I love others. Final scripture, 1 John 4.10. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. We have to love one another. And, and as I close this service, we have a, a chance today, especially fathers, because you know, we're, we're kind of the, put on a pedestal today by our families. That's the, the nature of the day. But people see us, and, and it's an opportunity to, to teach Maybe not to open up the Bible and, and teach a Bible study, but it's, it's an opportunity to let your light shine, to let your good work shine, that God be glorified. It's our chance to, you know, we, you know we, one time, sometimes we're in these situa situations and we just let things flow, let things take its course. But yet we have, and then we just want to sit back and put things on cruise control. And sometimes there's a chance, sometimes there's a time to relax and to spend time with family, and sometimes... God wants you to say something and do something. Wants you to, to, to act a certain way or, you know, because a lot of times we're, we're around family and, and we spend time at other people's homes and we're, we're the, whatever the celebration is. And not everyone there professes the same thing we profess. Not everyone else believes the same thing we believe. And I'm not telling anyone to make a scene or anything like that, but we have an opportunity to let our light shine. We have our opportunity to let our doctrine be made known, the things we teach in our lives. I want to close with the, what I, the, the notes that I gleaned from everyone else, the highlights of a father, but example, provider, dependable, playful, bold, and humble. And I believe these are all qualities that, that we need as we, as we let God work in our lives, as God speaks through our lives and is the things that we teach go into to others. Thank you.